So my name is Jacob Roram. I'm a public programs associate here at the History Center. So I get to work on uh, a lot of great programs here, including this one. However, I can't take credit for this. So this is a series, North Star Voices, that really gets to tell a lot of amazing stories of Minnesota's people and places. This was created by my colleague, Akoma Gaither, and she was the one who uh, planned this program, but she got an opportunity, uh, a terrific job, and so she's transitioned on. So I got the really great pleasure to jump into this, and uh, I think you guys are in for a very uh, wonderful program. So if you're not familiar with our guest today, Alexandra Houchin, uh, it's a, I was just in the last week steeped in reading about her, and I was just blown away by what she's accomplished, and so it's going to be great to be able to get into conversation with her tonight. Before we, not tonight, today. <laughs> Before we do, I just want to make a couple announcements. You see that we've had some great events coming up here at the History Center. Please check them out. Uh, we've got one tomorrow. It's part of our Schultz exhibit. It's, uh, we're doing a, a series of uh, programs on local Minnesota uh, comic artists. So please come and check that out. We've got a couple more on the slate for that. We've also got a couple good history forums coming up. That's our lecture series where we really uh, aim to bring the best in history scholarship, the newest, the best from around the country here to St. Paul. So we've got one next weekend, next Saturday, with Edward Curtis on his book, Muslims of the Heartland, where he really looks at the long history of Muslim life and Arab life here in the Midwest. It's going to be a terrific, terrific program. So please take a look at those. Also, uh, thanks for bearing with our crazy day today. It's, uh, it's wonderful to have so many people here at the History Center, but I do know that put a little snarl on some parking. But I do see how many people biked here today. This is certainly the highest percentage of cyclists I think I've had in an audience. So way to go, especially on the weather today. Way to go. Uh, thanks for doing that. I also just want to take a moment to acknowledge that the History Center is on the, the traditional and contemporary homelands of the Dakota people, and that we operate across the state of Minnesota, which shares its geography with 11 Dakota and Anishinaabe nations. And I mention this because it's really uh, valuable for us to rec rem remember that and to think about the implications of the history of Minnesota and its relationship to the indigenous people of this area, and to think about how we can partner together with our native nations and our native residents into uh, moving towards uh, a state that really allows everyone to flourish. And one thing I want to point out about our institution is our Native American Initiatives Department, which is just fabulous work in this regard. Everything from Native American artist fellowships to museum fellowships. They even had a college fair here recently where we had uh, over 200 Native students looking at different college options, both here in Minnesota and across the nation. So uh, big credit to them for all the programs they do to really make sure that the work we do here is in partnership with our native nations and our native residents. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna get started on our program. So I wanna introduce our speaker, Alexandra Houchin, but this, we're gonna watch a film to begin with. It's gonna do a better job than I can. That gives you a little uh, sort of overview of her life and her career. And uh, so we're gonna start with that and then we're gonna invite her up on the stage and we're going to have a conversation followed by some audience Q&A. So without further ado, here we are. If you'd like to welcome Alexandra Houchin to the stage. Wait. Whoa, whoa. Bonjour. Uh, first off, I just want to say thank you for coming, and um, I want to introduce myself in the Anishinaabe way. Um, so, bonjour in the Nui Migoni dog, bongi etago ninita ojibwem, ninga gagwe jatun jeo jibwemayan, Alexandra and Indigenous Jaganasha Moen. Ne nu kasi guaniashi kwe nindijin kasi ojibwe moen, or kasi for short. Megizi indo dame, Wisconsin keya ja wenong nindunjiba, and nagashi wenong ninda. 
My name's Alexandra, I'll give you my Ojibwe name. Um, I'm Eagle Clan, and I grew up in Southern Wisconsin, and I call the Fond du Lac Reservation home today. So hopefully that got all my nerves out. <laughs> So maybe let's start with growing up in Wisconsin. Did you have a connection to the outdoors then? You talk about you know, your connection when you're cycling with the spaces you're in. Did that something that come from childhood or what was that childhood like for you? <laughs> uh, it's funny, I always like go back to one specific memory that I had growing up. Uh, I mostly liked to eat Cheetos and play Aladdin, like the video game. Um, and like dreaded any outdoorsy things. Um, it was like in my 20s, I think, before I like actually bought a winter coat. Um, like my parents made me wear one when I was like a little kid, but once I got into middle school age, I just like went from the car to the building and then the building to the house and all around. Um, playing outside or being outside was never, never something that I really found any pleasure in. Um, like, I struggled a lot with my weight, too. Like, now looking back, I struggle with it, but I didn't really know that I was um, a big girl. And I just, like, hated running, hated doing anything. When I graduated high school, or actually, it was my junior year of high school, uh, I came home from finishing my last gym class, I think with, like, a D, maybe. <laughs> Um, and I was like, I never have to exercise ever again. Um, things changed, but I never, ever wanted to do anything hard ever when I was a kid. So if you don't like exercising, there's hope for you yet. <laughs> I'm in that camp myself. Um, when you said there was change, when did that happen or what was it that shifted that for you? The ch my love of the outdoors? Yeah. Um, I think in the video I kind of talked about it. My very first bike tour uh, was from Madison, Wisconsin to the Fond du Lac Reservation. And my mom had moved there. And um, I was like, well, I guess I don't really know too much about what that's like. And um, had a really deep spiritual journey uh, on that trip. That trip kind of carried on out west. But I learned a lot about myself. And then it was also this journey to lose weight um, and learn how to like like myself. I really, I really struggled with, you know, just this like reality I was trapped in. Um, I felt trapped in my own body. I felt trapped in my job, my living situation, uh, and I just kind of was curious if that was all that there was and decided to go on a bike trip. And it was like in the miles of that bike trip, in the miles of that journey, like asking myself questions that I never really had the guts to ask myself, and then further to answer questions that I never really had the guts to answer. I learned a lot and kind of got addicted to the, the space and the journey that the outdoors offers to us. When you, um, you, moved, you moved to Cloquet, what age were you then? When you moved? Uh, I, th I moved to Cloquet in 2017. I think I was okay. 28. Okay, so it wasn't that long ago. No, it's pretty recent. Um, I had moved to Arizona. <laughs> I applied to college, I think, when I was like 26, kind of, mm -hmm. to stop. I was like, well, I think I can finally do something. Actually, it was the bike touring. I was like... I had finished riding the Tour Divide, and that was l the first time I ever did something that I said I was going to do. And then that gave me a self-confidence. I was like, well, since I finished that, and it was really hard, uh, maybe I can finish college. So I applied to college when I was 26, and then uh, moved to Arizona to do that because I wanted to get as far away from home as I possibly could. Totally different climate, totally different everything. Uh, but paying out of state tuition was a horrible mistake. <laughs> so I moved home uh, to go to UMD in Duluth. I love how your uh, first thing that you wanted to, you know, 
follow through on was a 2,700 mile <laughs> endurance <laughs> bike race on the Continental Divide. Yeah, it was no big deal. <laughs> How did that come about? How did you decide that that was the thing? That was the goal? Um, so I was working as, I'd gotten a job delivering sandwiches for Jimmy John's. So I kind of like had been riding my bike for five hours a day and then got curious about riding more. Then I took that bike tour and that was all on road. And I didn't particularly like the road very much, but um, that was all I knew. I had never really mountain bike or anything. And then I got a mountain bike, uh, like a Surly Krampus. It was a big, fat tank of a bike. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and what that did was give me confidence to like ride over stuff and just like a tank. I just literally like pummeled through things, didn't have good lines, wasn't very, you know, skilled at it back then. And, um, my friend Brett also had just ridden the Tour Divide, raced it, and I just, he was like the coolest hardcore person I knew. He did it on a single speed. I did my first one on a geared bike, but I was like, oh, this guy is so cool. I, I could do that. Um, and it was so hard. I like, even back, looking back now, like, I have no idea how I didn't quit. I, I wanted to quit every day, but. Uh, in finishing that, it was like, you know, the mountains take a really long time to go up, but I was like, well, maybe that's like a semester, or I was making all these analogies. <laughs> I was like, okay, you know, you work really hard for X amount of time, and then you get the reward in the case of school, you get, you know, a month off in the winter, and then the whole summer off, um, in terms of like, riding your bike, you get to ride down, downhill for a really long time. You, you forget all the struggle of getting up to the top in the first place. Selective amnesia. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, what were some of those moments? Because you did it, but you decided to keep doing it. So what were those moments that s said to you, this is worth doing, this is worth continuing to pursue and to you know, and to continue to improve. It was mostly curiosity that kept me coming back to the tour divide. Uh, specifically, I think I think I finished it four times, um, and I quit one time on an individual time trial. But yeah, it was curiosity that kept me going back. The first time was it just seemed like such a huge, impossible thing. Like, there's no way I could ride my bike that far over that much elevation change. And I did it with no, like, I had no time constrictions. I think it was, like, 45 days we spent touring. And I was like, I think I could probably do that faster. And then I went back um, and did do it faster. I did it in 23 days. And then I did it in 18 days in, like, 20 hours and then this year I did it in 18 days and like 18 hours or something. Yay, <laughs> thanks. I sometimes don't fold laundry for 18 days. You know, it just sits there <laughs> waiting for me to fold it, you know, and I, so that's, uh, that's quite impressive. Um, one thing I, I, I believe I read this uh, when you talked about riding single speed as opposed to geared bikes, and if you're not familiar with cycles, that's you have one gear ratio. There's no gear shifting. Um, that you talked about how it connects you to the land you're riding on more. That there's a way that's more connective to what you're feeling. Is that? Yeah, I idea? think like one of the ways I like to explain it is that, I mean, there's just like no cheating on the hills, and not that shifting gears is cheating, kinda. Um, <laughs> but like I explicitly remember all the climbs, even like the little, the little nudges, the little hike -a bikes. I, there's just like you're directly connected to the ups and to the downs and to the flats. You know, like I appreciate different parts of a bike race than some of my geared counterparts because I'm like bring on the hills. Um, or mountains, or hike-a-bikes, 
and I dread the flat sections because, you know, I max out at 11 or 12, depending on whatever gear I set for a race, I can't pedal faster than um, a geared bike. Like this year, I lost a position in the Colorado trail race by four minutes because I got passed by a, a woman on a geared bike on this flat road. It's like a seven mile long flat road right to the finish and it was excruciating. But, you know, I picked my weapon, so. Yeah. Um, what would you say, so I watched your, I think it's the little tour divide diary, you know, sort of video oh, diary. Yeah. That, <laughs> yeah. If you're interested, on, on, you can find this on YouTube. I think I put a link in the program. It's sort of the unvarnished glimpse into what it's like to be on one of these races. And um, it doesn't always sound pleasant, but <laughs> what kind of goes on? What are those sort of like narratives mentally that go on? What are you dealing with physically when you're trying to do this undertaking? Yeah, I mean, the Tour Divide, my t experience on the Tour Divide this year was like, like for me, it was catastrophic and heartbreaking for like a multitude of reasons. First, it was this race, the Tour Divide, not even, it, it wasn't a race in the beginning for me, but it became this race that changed my life. It was like when I won um, in 2018 for women, it was l the first time ev anybody had ever really paid attention to me or it was the first time that I ever felt seen or, I don't know, it was like all these different complex feelings of getting attention, people asking me questions, people kind of focusing on this native narrative that I had literally never seen in sports. And then I just realized that, oh my gosh, this is a really big opportunity to do some of the work in native narrative change that I care about. And also to be recognized as an athlete when my entire life I hated exercise, struggled with my body image, and had never seen an athlete who looked like me. So it felt like a huge win in that way. And then I won again in 2019 on my single speed, which was like such a big deal because I beat all the other women on gears. And it was this thing where like people had told me year after year, like if you race single speed, you're setting yourself up with a disadvantage and people would all, like I could also see that sentiment, sentiment in like my own body image. Like if I'm not super skinny and fit, I'm setting myself up at a disadvantage to lose. But I won and it made me believe in like all of these impossible things and further that it wasn't a mistake that I won the first time that I like put in the work and had done it. So I had like, so many expectations for myself going into this year's Tour Divide, um, but also knew that the race, the women's race field was super stacked this year, which is incredible. But needless to say, I still wanted to win. <laughs> um, in, you know, in my eyes, I was still defending this title as the previous women's winner. And I, my ego had definitely gotten the best of me and I, I picked a gearing that was just too hard for my body to push day after day. Like I had toured over 2000 miles to the start and I was like, I think I got this. Um, but when it came to like riding 160 or 170 miles a day after day after day, I just couldn't uh, push the gear and had ended up walking my bike quite, quite a bit more than I wanted to and or expected to. Like walking up pavement road climbs, which are like the only time I never, like I never give my myself the excuse to walk. I'm like, it's a pavement climb, you can ride it. And yeah, it just was like really emotionally catastrophic to go from being first place, I, I got sixth place overall. And um, that, like that wasn't even podium, so it went from like, this huge race that defined my entire racing career to just kind of like, I felt forgotten at the back of the pack and like, I didn't do a good job. So it was like super 
emotional in that video that you mentioned was just kind of like I just started snapping clips of like my feelings and how disappointing it is to fail publicly um, for everybody to know what I'm capable of but to not achieve there I just felt like yeah really heart <laughs> really heartbroken mm -hmm. and wanted to make sure that people can see what that looks like too. And there's some, you know, I laughed a couple of times in the video. <laughs> yeah, it's not all doom and gloom. <laughs> yeah, it's not all doom and gloom, but no. Um, it was definitely took a lot of spirit every day to just keep moving forward. Yeah. Um, you mentioned when you won the sort of narratives about a native athlete. So could you tell a little bit about like, how do we think about, how do you think about identity and what's been the journey for you when you think about being indigenous, being an athlete, being an indigenous athlete? You know, has that been difficult or how has that been to navigate those different realms of your life and your as aspects of yourself and making sure that they're not, you know, you're not separating them out? Yeah, I mean, it's still hard not to separate them because bike racing world is so white. In fact, like all of my tribal community is here in Minnesota, up in Cloquet. And all of my bike racing requires me to be out west and to train out west. But like, first off, growing up, I was navigating this world of like my mom being a stolen child and like being told I was native or yeah, being told I was native, but really understanding my indigeneity as like my mom is native and it was less about me being native because I didn't really see myself in any, I didn't look like Pocahontas and I just felt like, well, if I don't look like that and if I can't talk to animals, <laughs> I'm probably not native, right? Um, so like dealing with that own aspect of my indigeneity uh, was really hard to look at. But then, even as an outside looking in at my childhood and seeing Native people, like, I knew about Jim Thorpe, mm -hmm. but I didn't know any other ath Native athletes existed. And, like, all the pictures I saw of Jim Thorpe were, like, old and then black and white. And I was like, oh, there's probably no Native athletes now anywhere. Um, so, like, growing up and never seeing like a native athlete, a professional native athlete doing anything, like that was like not even in the realm of what I thought was possible for me. Um, and then further being a native woman, uh, I never, like the only native women I knew were like my moms and my aunties. And just like carrying all of those parts of my identity into the bike race, racing space sometimes feels really lonely because like I'm a super funny person that's brag <laughs> but I like to laugh and you know make jokes about things and have levity in life but there's also like really serious issues in contemporary and native societies that are always in our face at all the time and you know when I'm racing my bike I have family issues and family drama and all of these things going on back home that are just more prevalent in indigenous communities than non-indigenous communities. And just think about like all that stuff that I'm carrying through these races too. Um, so I like, I, I want to be light and have fun all the time, but I'm also always like that really serious, <laughs> The really serious friend that's like, oh, actually, do you know about, you know, the Indian Child Welfare Act? Or do you know that, like, right now I'm really scared because it's getting argued in the Supreme Court? When it's like a lot of my contemporary bike racer friends are like, what's the Supreme Court? Or, um, <laughs> other questions like that, not to hate. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that you make a great point because not only, I mean, the, the ICWA, the ICWA challenge. So if you're not yeah. familiar with the Indian Child Welfare Act, it was a, a law passed by Congress in the 1970s to basically um, prevent what happened to your mother, correct? You know, so the yep. adoption 
of Native children into non-Native households. And it's been on the books for, you know, uh, 50, uh, almost 50 years, and it's been very successful at keeping Native kids in their communities. And uh, there was a challenge at the Supreme Court this year that went all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, and so there was a real worry by um, child welfare advocates that it would be overturned. It was upheld. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thankfully, yeah. because it is a law that has done really wonderful things um, for Native children. Um, but it's something I think we think about that history of boarding schools, which a lot of people are familiar with, but they don't right. realize in that post-boarding school era that it's continued. There's been continual um, effects in policies. Right, yeah, and there were, you know, like systemic um, poli laws and policies that were put into place to aid in assimilation. So it was like they attacked peoples and then land bases and then, you know, all, like, by, I'm skipping a bunch of stuff, but, um, <laughs> You know, all these other things just hadn't worked at um, getting natives to assimilate and or like leave their indigeneity behind. And they're like, oh, well, you know, a, a sure way we can do that is to attack children. And that was like the boarding school era. And then um, I think it was like federal policy from like the, I don't remember what year it kind of stopped being law, but in the late, uh, it was like 1950 or 1850 to, or no, 1950 to 1960 something. But it was the Indian uh, Adoption Project, was, which like for the first time in, you know, federal adoption policies or um, any policies for adoption, they tried to like race match. So like, you know, Hispanic kids would go with Hispanic families and Asian kids would go with Asian families, but they were intentionally putting indigenous kids with non-native fam like white families, which is what happened to my mom. Um, and like, man, there's a really good book. I can't remember the title of it either, but there's a really good book on the um, Indian Adoption Project that opened my eyes up to like, realized that the stories that my mom were telling me were not only like very true and very common, but like imposed federal policies that completely shaped her life. And further that like, you know, the Indian Child Welfare Act was put in place in 78 to protect native children. And it was supposed to work retroactively, you know, like even if you were adopted before 19, uh, 78, you, in theory, were supposed to be able to at least find out your tribal affiliation. In the case of my mom's adoption, it was a closed adoption, and all the information on her records was redacted, and it took her like 20 years to find her biological mom, but she eventually did, which, you know, is how I found my way back home, but not through like a really long journey of searching. So, like, even though ICWA exists, there are still flaws in it, but what I will still always say is that it is significant, um, not just for protecting our children, but also, like, as a, a foundational um, federal Indian policy that reaffirms our sovereignty. Like, we get to decide what we do with our people and our children. There's a terrific book uh, that our press published by Sandy Whitehawk, on oh, yeah, her that story, was, yeah, that's a good one. Too. On, um, you know, on her story of being adopted uh, as a Native and her journey of return. Um, so you can definitely check that out. And it's, yes, it's not something that was uncommon, you know, your mother's story. Yep. Um, could you talk about, you talked about the sort of racing career taking you far away from Cloquet. Um, could you talk about that sort of relationship you have with the Fond du Lac? band and the community there and your and the land there I notice you, you you would like to work in the gardens there and the food projects they have w what is that connection for you like you know yeah uh, coming home and finding home has been a really incredible special journey for me I've had I've just had a great experience I've met really supportive people made really great friends and just have found a lot of love and support like from the band explicitly, um, you know, help with my education and support, and like growing at Gitaganing, I don't have access to land, mm -hmm. 
to grow food on, but we have a community farming program that uh, where we're given access to like a quarter or an eighth of an acre to farm our own food. And we have a lot of resources for that producer training program that help us mm -hmm. learn how to grow food. I thought food came from grocery stores. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't know that you could grow a potato um, and learn that through the, this producer training program. So there's a lot of community building and a lot of programs and opportunities for learning mm -hmm. that my tribe itself puts on. And that way, through that is where I've learned, or I've met a lot of my friends, and um, a lot, I've met a lot of family. I have lots of cousins. <laughs> I've met a lot of cousins upon coming home. But that's also where my mom lives. And, you know, the film does an okay job uh, talking about that, but it's such a delicate issue to talk about, like, our relationships with our parents, like, whoever we are. You know, at the end of the day, my mom did the best she could with what she had, and she loved me. And, you know, there are highs and lows, and the youth part of myself was really angry for a long time, but it was upon coming home where I was able to just have these really hard conversations with my mom about how I felt and reflect on, reflect on my childhood and kind of just put all the complex stuff from a whole lifetime behind us and really start building a, a relationship where I feel like I see my mom finally. And it's really powerful and emotional to get to know somebody in that way after um, growing up with them and looking at them in a, in a certain way where, you know, I was like, I wanted her to be like the other moms but I would not trade her in for any other mom because like all the best parts of me come from her. So uh, coming home is a lot of different things, but um, it's mostly helped me learn and understand who I am as an Anishinaabe Kwe. I wanna get an opportunity for our audience to ask some questions in a few minutes. Could you, um, maybe to wrap up this part, could you give us a little bit of a recap of what you've done this year and what you're sort of looking forward to in the next? Yeah, I'm totally gonna brag because, <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Because this year I accomplished like the biggest dream I've been having for like 10 years before I was a bike racer person, before I raced my first tour divide. I had always wanted to do um, what is called the Triple Crown Challenge. Um, and that's racing all three of like the premier US bike packing races. Bike packing races are um, these self supported. I like to say odysseys um, across the country in the Tour Divide, that situation in that, it's like 2,700 miles from Banff, Alberta, all the way to the Mexico border. Um, and then the Colorado Trail Race, which is 525-ish miles um, across, I call it the backbone of Colorado, but it's a race where the majority of the course is above 10,000 feet, topping out at uh, just over 13,000 feet with like 75,000 feet of elevation gain. And um, the Arizona Trail Race, which is a race that starts in, at the Mexico border in Arizona and finishes at the Utah state line. And that's like 800 miles, but includes um, Hiking, oh, taking apart your bike, attaching it to a backpack, hiking down 5,000 feet to the Colorado River, crossing the Colorado River, and then hiking out like 7,000 vertical feet to the North Rim. Um, and that was like 800 miles long. Um, and I did all of them with the Grand Departs this year, um, coming in second place for women 
uh, behind Katya, uh, my friend Katya, and setting a new women's single speed record for all of it. <laughs> So more plans for that in the coming year, or is this a different um, direction? <laughs> after I've been racing pretty hard for the last decade or so. I think I've done like for sure over 20, maybe 30 bike races that are over 300 miles long. So I'm taking a year off of bike racing. Um, I will probably race a couple, but just because <laughs> it's like what my friends do. Uh, and uh, I'm training for a 100-mile running race in September. <laughs> woo, woo. So no biking, just running, you know. Next it'll be canoeing. and Run, Running know. is so hard. <laughs> Holy. Uh, would, do you have one piece of advice if someone's like, this sounds interesting, I've never done this kind of, you know, racing, what would be sort of the, the advice you might give someone? Oh, man. I would say... Get prepared and just do it. <laughs> it worked for you. Yeah, it'll go so wrong, but <laughs> every once in a while it turns out good. <laughs> well, uh, I want to turn it over to you all. If you have questions, you can raise your hand and uh, myself or uh, our volunteer Andy will run a mic to you so we can all hear the question and uh, we'll get your perspective. So. Buju Wabin and Dijnikas. Hi, my name is Wabin. Um, so you talked about um, kind of having a difficult time with um, bringing your indigeneity into cycling. Can you talk about how you have found um, an indigenous inclusive community within cycling, um, especially within finding other indigenous women to ride with? Yeah, but it's been really difficult, and in fact, um, really the only spaces, the only place where I ride with indigenous women is here, uh, and it was like uh, this group of us kind of started fat biking together a handful of years ago, and those are like really, okay, that was my first indigenous cycling community, now it's like kind of coming back to me um, and that was mostly just like <laughs> I went to my friend Sarah's house one day and I was talking about how I was writing this grant to get five fat bikes and she's not a cyclist but she's a runner and um, my other friend Hannah was over there and Sarah's like well if you get the fat bikes I'll ride with you and I was like okay and she looks at Hannah she's like would you do it she's like yeah so I got the fat bikes and we all rode together, which was sick. You know, there's like cool moments where we're all parked at a trailhead and we all have our tribal license plates. Um, and then other, you know, weird moments where people were like, oh, you can't bike here. But it's like, you know, in the ceded territory, we're like, oh, this is actually just like what Anishinaabe do. We can bike here. Um, <laughs> So just like having a, a sassy group of native women to ride with was really meaningful. But in terms of like bike racing world, um, I didn't have a ton of people to do that with. Um, actually, my title sponsor for racing this year was the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. And that had come from, I just like showed up at this event, this outdoors event, and I saw a woman, I was like, oh, what's my cousin doing here? She wasn't my cousin, <laughs> but she looked like me. And um, she's like, my tribe should sponsor you. And you know, lo and behold, the Eastern Band of Cherokee did. And they invited me to their neck of the woods to show kind of some of the stuff that they're doing out there. And they have a huge community. So all that goes to say is I think we just have to start it. And then further, we just need like, somebody to keep showing up because since that group of women i used to fap we just like i've been traveling so much and i haven't biked with them in like two years so i think it's hard to find but i don't think it's impossible if we build it thanks for your question Uh, 
Hi, um, my name's Anthony Williams. I'd like to thank you for letting me talk to you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming. Uh, can you like, I I'm really, this has been my first year getting into ultra. I DNF'd a 333 mile race this year because I lost my phone, which means I lost my support and I got very scared. So I had to call people and get rescued. Mm -hmm. But can you like describe some of the uh, the things that like went wrong or some of your mechanicals that happened during some of these races and how you like overcame it? Did you have to do something weird to the derailleur? Or you don't have a derailleur. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But yeah, like. Go it, single speed. <laughs> Yeah, any anything and how you got through some of those dark times that I've it's is really a cool moment to be able to talk to somebody that like has been in those dark times that uh I think that's ultra people love, but it's also very hard to get through it in that moment. When you when you say you have no idea how you finish this, I I think you truly mean that cuz there's you you have no idea, but you made it and that's super cool. Um thank you. Yeah, that's a really great great question. And I've had like a, gazil a gazillion of those experiences where things have gone just catastrophically. Um, I remember one time I was doing this race across Kansas. It was a 350 mile race. And I think I was like 280 miles in. And I was just like stuck. Doped, blasting Lizzo from I like to bring a little boombox and I was like blasting it super loud and the the wave of the 200 right the 200 mile riders was coming toward me so I was like also trying to look really badass and like I wasn't tired <laughs> um, just smashing up this hill and I go to smash and my I snap the pedal off of my bicycle. Um, like the part that screws into the crank arm. So I couldn't get the bolt out from the crank. Well, I ended up getting it later, but it was really hard to get out of the crank. And I just like, there was just a little nub. I tried um, taping a rock <laughs> to the pedal. Uh, th that did not work. I tried, um, tied... Uh, I took a tree branch, and uh, after I got the bolt out, uh, I tried to put a tree branch in there. That didn't work. Um, and I used my phone, and I called um, somebody, and I was like, hey, I have to quit. And they're like, oh, well, where you're at, there's no roads for, like, the next six miles. And I was like, oh, okay, well... I had a huge pity party and just like walked alongside my bike for the next six miles. Um, occasionally like collapsing in the grass, <laughs> pitying myself for, I was like, well, there's no, there's nothing I can do. But I figured since I was w walking and all these people were passing me and they're like, you're doing great. How's it going? And I'm like, you know, not so great. And I was like, well, do you have a pedal? Like, who carries extra pedals in a race? But I'm still asking people. And I find this one guy who's, like, also sprawl, sprawled out in pity. And he's like, well, I'm quitting. I'm like, oh, cool. Can I have your pedal? <laughs> <laughs> he's like, yeah. Except uh, the pedal was seized in his crank, and we could not get it off. I was, like, bashing my bike tool with a bigger rock trying to get it off we couldn't get it off and I was like okay well that's a sign that I need to quit I, I keep walking trying to get to that road and um meanwhile all the time just asking I'm like oh yeah you got a pedal and people are like no no <laughs> and finally some guy is like yeah I have an extra set of pedals right here <laughs> I was like no shit I have to finish this race <laughs> um I put the pedal on, and um, it, it was a, a Crank Brothers clip-in pedal. It was like, you know, this big. Uh, so I took my belt off and tied my pedal to it. And it was wonky, but um, I didn't get the result I wanted. I walked a lot. I cried a lot. I ran out of water because I was like, well, I'm quitting. Um, but I ended up crossing the, fin crossing the finish line, which at the end of the day felt 
better because, or it felt the best because I finished. Um, and I was racing my friend for a beer. We had both like went beer sober and we're like, okay, the first one or the last one done has to buy the beers. And he beat me by like six minutes. <laughs> But still, you know, I had to buy my friend beer and I finished the race and it's just kind of about moving forward regardless. You know, now I would just keep going. I'd ask people for pedals, but um, for me, the experience of quitting a race is like the most heartbreaking feeling. Um, so I, when I go into a race, I am like, okay, you know, if it's a 300 mile race, I'm like, do I have six days to walk the entire course? You know, just making sure I have enough time to do whatever it takes if that's carrying my bike for 20 miles or whatever. Um, just because I, I'm, I get most excited about the growth, that the growth that happens within my brain and emotional space and not so excited. Like, I don't so much care about um, winning all the time, even though I told you guys I was sad about losing the Tour Divide. <laughs> Other questions? You early on mentioned that you spent some years doing quite a bit of drugs, alcohol, but you decided, hey, enough of that at some point, and got healthy and moved on. I'm just wondering, if you could say more about the decision point, did any of your using friends also decide to stop, et cetera? Yeah, I think that's like a super important question. And it's like, I'm a lot better at talking about it now because I'm like so far away from the person that I used to be. But it really just started out as, I, I was, again, it's like the curios curiosity thing. I was young and started it was like prescription painkillers. That's just what my best friend and I did together. Um, and then I just kept, I was like really uncomfortable in my body um, and really wondering what else there was in the world. It was just like, is this, you know, is this it? Is this gonna be my life? Am I just gonna drink and get high forever? Um, and I, like, I don't think it was exactly one moment. It was kind of like, you know, I lived in this house with all my friends who did drugs and then kind of was like, I think I want to try something different. And I moved away and lost all contact um, with any of those people I used to hang out with. And they were my best friends, but it was also like the only way for me to get away from that was to pretty much start over and I like started everything over. I changed my entire diet, uh, changed my entire lifestyle, got rid of like my TV and my microwave and like everything that was convenient and really went deep into my eating um, and my weight loss journey. And it was like the people that I started surrounding myself with weren't using um, and it just kind of slowly started to be this thing in my past. Um, my high school best friend overdosed and died, and that was kind of um, this really complex journey to go through. You know, I introduced her to heroin, um, and she took it too far, and it was like, do I want to just lose the people around me? It was like all these really big, dark, scary questions. And like, as a, I still consider myself an addict. I like go so ha hard on everything out there. Um, but I've found that it's not exactly the same. Ultra sports aren't exactly the same as drugs, but I have these hard things that like, do crazy things to my neurotransmitters, crazy things to my emotions, and it kind of like fulfills what drugs used to do in like a way 
healthier and different way. You know, I'm like, oh, I have to exercise every day. Otherwise, I get sad and depressed. And then I make bad food choices and then, then those choices. And then, you know, it's like, what could happen from there? So I've really found that, like, I don't know, for better or for worse or for however far I've pushed the ultra racing stuff, for me, um, it's better than dying of a heroin overdose. So that's all. Meet you. <laughs> but thanks for asking. I don't know the, I don't know the exact answer. Um, and I don't know how, like, I don't know how I came out alive, but I did. Hi, I'm a really big fan. Um, <laughs> you talk a lot about your body, and in the video you talked about how you, you feel really good in your body when you're biking, but you don't feel good in your body when you're not biking. Um, I think that's super common for folks born not men, yeah. especially in our age group. Yeah. Um, have you resolved that? If you have not resolved that, have you made progress? Um, if you have, how did you do it? And like, have you come to any sort of resolution in that regard? Yeah, I am definitely in a better emotional place than I was during the making of that film. Um, I was really, really struggling during the time that we made that film, I think, you know, four years ago or something. It's when we filmed it. Um, and I like my body more. I like my body sometimes, and then sometimes I'm just really disappointed. You know, I got really big when I was a kid, and I just didn't, I had no idea. I didn't know what calories were. I didn't know anything. Um, and I still live with like some disappointment and regret for like letting myself get to that point. And then um, also having humility for myself, being like, you know, I was so young, I didn't know, and I'm doing the best that I can with it. Um, but I do feel really disappointed in my body when I see it naked. Um, that's, it, it sucks. Sometimes I'm like, oh, hey, girl, you look real good. But um, when I look at it, you know, I see all these parts of myself where, you know, I get to hide them all the time every day. But I'm just like left looking in the face like, oh, I wonder what kind of athlete I could be if I didn't have this or that or this or that. And then I go to the polar opposite of being like, you know, I think I'm a lot nicer. I think I'm a lot kinder. I think I'm a lot more compassionate because of what I went through as a bigger bodied person. And, you know, I find a lot of gratitude in being a big, like having been a big girl and being like, okay, well, you know, I really got into art. I really got into music. I really got into all these things that allowed me to like find self-worth and things that weren't the way that I looked and to get good at all these things that made me emotionally feel good. But it still go, I, it goes back and forth when I, especially like it's so easy to compare myself to the other people I race my bike against because I mean, that's what we're doing. We're comparing times. Uh, and when I don't look like them, I just want to make excuses and give up. But then also, just remember that I think there's a lot more people who look like me, have bodies like me, who just haven't got into the racing scene or gotten into the spaces that I occupy. And by just being there and being myself and showing up the way that I am in the good parts and the bad parts, um, hopefully more people can start to find like the good parts of themselves. And also, you know, have conversations with like, I don't love what I look like, but also, you know, I'm a lot nicer because of the way that I look. It's important what you're doing, so keep doing it. Thank you. <laughs> doesn't work upside down <laughs> uh, anyway hi um, I have, so many people have asked so many good questions that 
I don't know if my question's going to fit, but you've had a ton of life experience, some good, some bad, you know, that balance that we talk about in life. And you've had um, issues with your body, you've had issues with lack of parent at certain times, you've had issues of um, being an athlete and knowing disappointment, but also you've had the other side of the coin where you looked at your body and said, I don't like this, I'm going to work on it. And you've had experiences with drugs, alcohol, all of that. And I've spent a bit of time here, there, like Net Lake, Fond du Lac, all those places. And so I know there are many children, many teens, many young women, well, everybody's younger than me right now, but um, <laughs> many, many people in their 40s and 50s that wish they could be like you, and they haven't got a way to get there. And I'm wondering, as you grow older and you come to the realization, I can't keep up with that 19-year-old, that 20-year-old anymore. I can still be good, but good at age 42 is different than good at age 19. I was wondering if you had thought ahead, because you're right now in the prime of your career, I would say. If you thought ahead to, how could I impact those Fond du Lacers? How could I change those equations, those young women, those kids that really just walk down the road there and don't know where to go next? You know, there's not, not that much going on in their lives right now. And that you could find um, a way, as you progress through your career, to think about what's next, you know, what am I going to do next to help those other Indian kids, those other Native kids? And it doesn't have to be just the girls. There's a lot of struggling young men, too. And to have them find something special in their lives that you have, you're in a position to help where uh, it's not, not happening for me. So I'm thinking, have you thought ahead about that and got a, any kind of... Uh, feelers out for what you might be able to do for the the young people of Fond du Lac. Thanks. Oh, ah, what a great question. Um, because I've been really thinking about that stuff a lot. Um, and I've talked about it a lot because I'm noticing this year, more than any other year that I've ever been bike racing, that I'm kind of, I started doing this stuff in my 20s in my early 20s and now I'm in my mid 30s and the next generation of bike racers is coming in and they're kicking my ass and it's great um, but also realizing that you know the responsibility part of my life I, I do so much thinking about my role as a relative and my role in this life to make sure that you know, I'm honoring what those who came before me gave up such that I can live this life now. Also while thinking about what those to come need from me. And I think first off, uh, talk is cheap. So for me, a million people could tell me a million different things but I'm not gonna do any of that because I like to do what I like to do. Um, so I think that by showing people what can be done, what I've done, who I am, trying to like really always show up as my authentic self, like the person that I am to my friends, the per person that I am to my family, and be that person across all the different spaces that I exist in is like, First, a great way for people to maybe see themselves in me. Like, at the end of the day, I think I'm just like a pretty average, run-of-the-mill uh, native chick. I, I love my family. I do my best to be a good relative. Um, and I'm always learning stories and trying to use the language when I can. Um, but also, just... <laughs> You know, I was like on this path to be a dentist. Um, I was going to school, doing this, and it was kind of this like thing that I was like, okay, this is what I need to do to give back. You know, I've got all this privilege. I need to do something with it. And I was talking to um, 
the former chairwoman of our tribe, Karen Diver, and I was telling her this, the story that I've been telling like everyone, like I'm gonna be a dentist because blah, 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 blah. And she's like, cut the, cut the shit. <laughs> you don't have to be a martyr to make your people proud. Um, like, what, she's like, what do you want for the people that you love? You know, I'm like, I just want them to be happy, you know? I want them to live their best life. I want them to feel loved and at the end of it, be happy. And she's like, why would you think your relatives or ancestors want anything different of you? Like, you should do what you want to do and follow your heart. And it really made an impact on me. And so I left my jobs and decided to race bikes full time. And that's been like the vehicle through which I get to be here today talking to y'all about stuff that I really care about and thinking about the future. Like, I want more Native people in all outdoor spaces um, because it's been, first off, it's been really healing for me. Second off, it's allowed me to create and participate in contemporary ceremony. For me, it might not be ceremony for anybody else, but like I've been able to bring um, like some of the old timey cultural traditions to this contemporary bike race space where I get to go all sorts of deep within and then all sorts of deep without. And just trying to like be that person and know that like that is good for native people. So right now I, I'm being selfish and exploring what I can do on a bike, maybe to make a statement, maybe to show people what is possible, maybe to answer deep questions within myself to see what I'm capable of but in the future I like you know here's my perfect dream world that we can build a space where we have like a climbing wall and a gym and training program and like I have this dream for a bike race during racing season like that machine in the video that I was on in the beginning is a bicycle powered thresher for um, threshing wild rice, you know? Like, I have all these visions for what is to come, but I still don't, like, how, have the answer of how to make it happen. Um, and I think that just comes with time. I, like, really believe that the Manu do are... They got a, plat a path for me, and, like, I can either swim upstream and fight it or just, like, enjoy the ride. So I'm trying to enjoy the ride and see what I can learn so that hopefully, you know, all sorts of little Shanab kids back home and families and just all people can like have the knowledge and skills to do hard things because I think we really learn a lot, but you gotta have the tools to even show up. So hopefully that answered it. It was a good question. <laughs> I think that's a great place to wrap up. But before we do, and before we thank Alexandra, I want to just point out a couple things. One is we have surveys on the way out. If you can take a few minutes, this is super helpful to let us know what you appreciate about the program today. Because we like to make sure we're doing programs that meet our audience, you know, where they're at and what they're looking for. So if you like today, please stop, fill out a survey. It's really helpful for us. And then second, I want to just draw attention we have a program coming up January 6th here with Casey Keeler. She's a professor at University of Wisconsin. She's citizen Potawatomi and Tulum Miwok. And she's writing, she's going to be talking about her book, American Indians in the American Dream, which is about the navigating of federal Indian policy and federal housing policy here in the Twin Cities. And uh, so it very much sort of you're interested more to get curious more about that aspect of today's talk. Please come back. But please join me in thanking Alexandra for her generosity and her honesty today. <laughs> <laughs>